This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale, I am a writer and film critic and today I'm delighted to be talking to Carol Baum, a film producer who has put her wisdom and wit together to write a book called Creative Producing, a pitch to picture guide to movie development. The book is a kind of combination of memoir and how-to guide and reaps from many years of experience and knowledge at the top of the industry making such films as David Cronenberg's Dead Ringers, Steve Martin's Father of the Bride and Jackknife with Robert De Niro, along with many, many more. She has lots of credits to her name. If you enjoy the episode, please remember to leave a review or to tweet to spread our name and the link far and wide on social media. But before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. Publishers say is memoirs don't sell anymore lately. I think there was a glut, glut of them, and so they recommended against it. But I had already written the memoir part, so I had always planned to put my class on paper because that's what the book is. It's this is what I've been teaching for twelve years, and so it was relatively simple to just take my syllabus and put it down the way I put it down, and then kind of fold in. The memoir. So that's it. So that's the story of the book. I like how it turned out. There's sort of a sense of it coming full circle as well, in the sense that your your career began in uh, sort of in publishing. That's true. And I talk about that a lot to anybody who wants to know how I got started, especially the students. You know, they all want to know what's your entry level? How do we get into the business? What did you have to do? What dues did you have to pay? And working in publishing when I did it, was a very popular thing to do for college girls in New York City. There were a lot of publishing houses. It was a common entry-level job. It is not now. I don't think people enter publishing in order to get to the movies. I don't think anybody thinks that way. So everybody's a little surprised that uh, I talk about that background. But for me, it was key. It was crucial to how I my taste, my judgment, how I learned to read manuscripts, and then scripts, it all started in public at Bantam Books. So also I got the confidence to, in my taste, to know that I knew something that was publishable, which, you know, the, you're not born with that. You do have to figure out how to, how to do that. So that's the publishing thing. But it doesn't help now getting a book published because the rules are all different. I guess that's one of the problems with sort of you, you learn how to live a life and then all of a sudden the, the environment has changed and those lessons are not quite as relevant as they used to be. Well, you know, the way I have approached the business and and producing hasn't changed for me personally. I do it the way I do it, which is I'm a writer-oriented producer. So that doesn't change. You find a writer and you talk about ideas with that writer you like. So how has that changed? How you sell it now is different. But in terms of the development process, which is what the book is, how do you develop? How do you find a writer in the first place? Then what happens when you like somebody? But um, other people aren't doing it that way. Everything is so marketing driven that people start sometimes from the marketing angle and work backwards. That's not the way I've ever done it. I I remember reading once, I think it was a book on film noir, and somebody said a plot twist is the cheapest form of special effect you can have. And I, I thought of that when I was re- when I was reading your book because I was thinking with this idea of centering things on writers, in a sense, that's kind of the cheapest part of movie making is getting a re- a good writer with a great idea, and yet it's so difficult to do. Well, it may be the cheapest part, but it is the most crucial part, and people forget that. People forget how important the writer is, how important the voice is, the originality, the guts that it takes to write something that hasn't been done a million times. All of those things go into it. And there's no writer out there who doesn't think that his or her work is the most original thing around. But on the other hand, many of them will say, what's the formula? 
what do I do to, you know, get into the formula so I can sell it? And I find that always a very depressing question, to tell you the truth, <laughs> you know, but I, but I get it a lot. But I, you, you mentioned something quite, I think it's quite late on in the book where you sort of say most writers don't think in terms of, you know, three act structure and they have to do this on this page and that on that page. And yet... There are so many books out there which seem to be, you know, almost like recipe books for how to write a screenplay, something I personally have always been very dubious about. You know, I think because I'm married to a writer who always had disdain for that kind of thinking, I, you know, I may be brainwashed in that regard because <laughs> he just would not tolerate that kind of talk. And mm. he had a, a agent once who said, because uh, Tom is, is, is a screenwriter, but also a novelist, and an agent who wrote a book about, a how-to book about how to get your book published, and he urged Tom to read his book about how to do it. And Tom was offended by that. You know, that's mm. not how you talk to a real writer. You know, the real people, the talented people, the people who believe in themselves, they don't want to talk that way. They don't need that. But, you know, that's a handful. The rest of the world, writers who, there are plenty of them, who want to know the way in, and they'll keep doing that, which is fine. And I'm happy that people are getting hired and getting their books published and their scripts published. It's just not something that I respond to. So your transition from um, working publishing to the to the to the uh, movie industry took several took took a took a step. Uh, perhaps you'd like to tell our listeners about that that uh, that transition? Well, I had many jobs over the years, and I was always a person who liked working in a company. I did not want to go out on my own and be hang up my shingle as a producer. I didn't even know what that meant. So the jobs uh, in New York, uh, there was one after another after another, and they all ended up being similar. I worked for different companies, but they all wanted the same thing. They wanted me, who had access, to find a manuscript that could be made into a movie. And I worked for many of these people in New York. There are not so many there anymore. But when I was doing it, uh, I guess my biggest score was The Shining when I worked for a company called The Producer Circle. And The Producer Circle is a tiny little company. They came from the theater. They were not movie people, though they had produced, I think, one or two movies. But that's not what they were known as. They were known as theater people. Uh, Bobby Fryer, who was a partner in the company, ran the Amundsen Theater, which is the biggest theater in L.A., and that was his identity. So they hired me, the book person, to find a book, and I found it. I found it in spades. And I said, okay, this is what you hired me for. You, in order to acquire this material, you're probably going to have to put down your own money because this will once this starts to get exposed in the world, there will be bidding and you'll lose it. So they had money, lots of money, and they put down a lot of money to acquire The Shining. And that put them on the map, put me on the map. And after that, I was known as the girl who found The Shining. So you don't have to say much more than that to people, really. Um, and that was a coup. But I had done it many times before that. I I found the Stepford Wives and I found Kramer versus Kramer and Jaws. And those are the things that pass through my desk. Sometimes they were represented by agents. Sometimes they were given to me personally from an editor who liked me. Um, there are all kinds of ways to get books, but books were key to my livelihood. That's what I did. And now they're called, what I did is now called a scout. There are mm -hmm. book scouts now hired to do just that. Uh, they work out of their houses. They don't go to offices, but they comb the world of publishing to find out what's the next hot book. And that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. The bidding situation has changed. I don't think there's so many bidding wars anymore, but there still are books that are everybody knows. The buzz is out. Everybody knows there are going to be important books. And everybody's on top of them. And that was true then, and that's true now. I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, Flower Moon, um, it's a very bad title because I never remember the title. But yeah. anyway, you know, Scorsese, that was a big book. David Grand's book, I think everybody knew 
it was going to be a bestseller, but a difficult book to translate. Not everybody's going to bite that off. But um, I don't know if there was a bidding war, but I expect there was. I expect that a book uh, that rich and deep and terrific is going to get a lot of people jumping up and down about it. And, you know, and you can't compete with Scorsese and you don't. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely and what form would these books be coming uh, would you be seeing them pre-publication would you be seeing them sort of in manuscript uh, uh as a way of sort of preempting uh competitors if i didn't see them in manuscript i wasn't doing my job right by the time the book was in galleys uh forget it by the time it was published it's too late it's like everybody has seen it i mean you can still do it of course not everything gets bought in manuscript But in those days, manuscript was key, and it was a year or two before publication. So there wasn't the, you didn't know, you know, we were guessing we could all, we all talked to each other. Hey, have you read this one? Have you read the Chinese? I don't think I shared that with anybody, but usually I had friends at all the company and we, we shared manuscripts because you got fired if you didn't bring in the hot book. And and that's how it worked. And I expect that's pretty much the same now, but it's well in advance. Stephen King, he didn't he, he didn't enjoy the process of The Shining. You know, well, we all know it's famous that he didn't like the Stanley Kubrick uh, end product. But even even at the script stage, he wasn't particularly happy. Well, what happened is he wasn't known yet. Carrie was not released yet. It was in the works and people didn't know him. He was not a household name yet. However, he knew, you know, he had the confidence. He knew that he was going to be a big deal. He just knew it. Sometimes that happens. And he radiated that kind of confidence. And in his deal was that he could write the first draft screenplay. And oftentimes companies don't like that because the writers who adapt their own books sometimes want to keep too much. They're not really translating the book into a movie, and that stands to reason. And that's what happened. Stephen King wrote a very, very long script. It's a big book, and he kept everything in there. And I had to give notes because that's my job. Not only do I find the material, I have to give notes to whomever to make it better. And he took offense. He did not like notes it it was an unusual situation because <clears throat> I was the only one in that company who did that job, who gave notes to a writer. And I think he was waiting for the rest of the people in the company to speak up. And that never happened. And I think he was insulted. And then when we sold it to Kubrick and to Warner Brothers, he said th- this these words, uh, well, he's Stanley Kubrick, but I'm Stephen King. And so wow. he knew... His voice had to be heard. And and then he did it. He did his own version of it, you know, and he was very vocal about not liking the movie. And I understand that because some of the values in his book were were not Kubrick's values. But Kubrick made a Kubrick movie and Stephen King made a Stephen King movie afterwards. I don't know what he thinks about it now, all these years later, but probably the same thing, I would imagine, you know. I mean, some writers uh, won't sell their books to the movies. Walker Percy is famous for not selling his books to the movies because they don't want to see that happen. They don't want to see a translation that isn't close to what they intended. Most writers will sell their books because the money is good and they, you know, writers don't make a lot of money sometimes unless they're gigantic. But regular your regular writer uh, needs that movie sale. And also people like the movies. But um, there are certain writers, I can only think of Walker Percy now, but who just say no, you can't well, have Salinger it. might be another as well. Well, Salinger is a good example too. No to everything. And recently I heard that somebody was able to get the rights to Catcher in the Rye. I don't know. I, I don't know whether that will ever happen. But yes, he certainly was famous for it. You know, people would go make pilgrimages to Salinger's when he didn't want to talk to anybody. I know that Terence Malick has wanted to uh, make a, a film of Walker Percy's The Movie Goer for, for decades. Well, that's interesting because I have that script, uh, the Terry Malick script. So somebody must have gotten Walker Percy to allow that to happen. Uh, my friend Jim McBride also did a script of The Movie Goer. 
the moviegoer has huge fans. I mean, it's a classic. But I don't know who, who allowed that to happen. He must have said, okay. He must have liked Terrence Malick. I, I don't know. I don't know the history of that. But yes, that did happen. It sits on a shelf somewhere. You moved from New York when you when you start working for Dolly Parton's film company. That's oh yeah, that's that's much later. I came out to California because my husband, who's the writer, uh, had a movie going, and his agent, he had a big time agent, who said you should come out to California. I'll get Carol a job, and he was such a big deal agent. I took him at his word, and it was time for us to move because mm-hmm. things were bubbling in California for Tom. And I had made many trips out there for different companies for different reasons. And so I was familiar with the terrain. And I thought, why not? Why not try it? And then Harry Ufflin, true to his word, set me up with a lot of people for jobs. None of them were a good fit. But I came out with the the same company, the Shining, the Purdue Circle. So that was my connection. I had a job already, which was great. They allowed me to be, they had a California office, they had a New York office, and I transitioned. And uh, the Dolly job came much later. I think I had jobs before that happened, you know, because I always had a job. And the jobs, sometimes they don't last more than a couple of years. Mm. You know, they can last or not. You know, it's it's sometimes out of your control. Um and I worked for studios, which was a lot of fun. I worked for Lorimar. That was all pre-Dolly. And I worked for Fox. And then um, Sand Dollar came calling because Sand Dollar, Dolly Parton's company, is Sandy Gallen and Dolly Parton, hence Sand Dollar. And they were starting a new company. Dolly is a very sharp businesswoman. And Sandy is a very, was, he's no longer with us very big time manager of music people, Neil Diamond, Michael Jackson, the Pointer Sisters, you know, Mac Davis, big people who toured all the time. And Sandy was very, very successful. And he and Dolly were best friends. And they decided to start a movie company with the backing of CAA, which was crucial. Because if you have an agency like CAA saying, we're going to help you, that's very good. And and so there was a job opening and somebody said, go up for the job. And I said, you know, it didn't seem right. I didn't know Sandy and I, and Dolly is not a Jewish girl from New Jersey. You know, it <laughs> felt a lot. But I went in there and it became clear pretty quickly that this was a, a, going to be a very good company to work for. And so it was. I stayed there 10 years. And at this stage, you're—I mean—you make the distinction in the in the book about uh, you know lots of people don't know what a producer is, and and you define yourself as a, a creative producer who is putting together a package of a, a screenplay, um, a director, maybe the 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 stars, and then sort of seeing that through into production. Uh, maybe you could explain. Uh, um, sort of sort of uh, when you start doing that because you're, you're you've been picking up things like the shining and, and and putting that and and putting those things together but when do you sort of transition into this creative producer uh, role I think what I learned when I was at Fox as an executive and at Lorimar as an executive is that the job of the executive is to do everything it hadn't been that when I worked for producer circle I was just the book finder but by the time I got to Lorimar and I found, I got my hands on an officer and a gentleman. And that clearly was a movie. It was a script. It wasn't a book. It was a movie that I thought should be made. And then that's when I learned it. I learned, oh, good for me to say that. But I'm the one who has to get a director. I have to, I have to figure out who the actors are. That's suddenly my job. I'm the packager. And that's when I learned it. I learned it because I had to, because otherwise it would have just sat around. And somebody's got to do it. And then I learned, you know, that I had to make a bunch of new friends, uh, talent agents, director's agents. I always was the writer agent person, but now my uh, I expanded to other lines. And Officer and a Gentleman happened with, uh, you know, Richard Gere and, and um, Deborah Winger, and it was a big hit. And it was just a script sitting around. So that had to be put together. And 
on Taylor Hackford, who was a virtual unknown at the time. He had just done one picture called The Idol Maker. And that's what packaging is. You say, oh, Taylor Hackford, he's good. And everybody says, I don't know him. The company people say, I don't know mm-hmm. him. Can you get a bigger name? And then you try to get a bigger name. And then you don't get a bigger name for what, one reason or another. And then Taylor's name keeps coming up and meetings are had. And he's so impressive. And finally, they said, yeah, OK, we'll do it with him. And that's how it happens. And that's what packaging is. You're taking a chance. Sometimes you're taking a chance. Sometimes you get Stanley Kubrick. But sometimes you're you're saying, I'll get behind this new filmmaker because I believe in him. And I think he can get talent because he's great. And you have that's your selling thing every single time. You have to, you're always selling somebody. I mean, we are salespeople, even though I'm a creative producer because I work on the material and try to make it the best that it can be. But finally, I'm pitching and I'm selling and I'm trying to convince the non-believers out there, who is everybody, and <laughs> that this one is worthy, that these projects that I like are worthy. And that's an, that's a hard job sometimes. It doesn't happen easily. And it goes back to that thing about taste as well that you mentioned earlier. You know, you have to have trust in your own vision. You have to be able to look at Taylor Hackford after he's done one film only and say, no, this guy can handle it. This guy can handle a bigger, He can. he's ready to step up onto a bigger stage. You know, taste is a funny thing to define. Um, people tell me I have good taste because my projects are tasteful, but I don't know how to teach taste. I, I don't know. I really don't know. I think I've always had good taste in writers. I guess I have good taste in directors. But what does that mean? How do you how do you teach that? And because my students ask me that, and it's one of the questions that I don't have a good answer for. If you, if you have a good answer, let me know. <laughs> I think it's, it's it's you know what I tell them is you have to read everything, you have to see everything, you measure the good things against the bad things. What are the good things? Where the good things are movies that you've seen, movies that win Oscars, uh, the, the famous people, you know, David Mamet and Aaron Sorkin and and Tarot Pinter and the people we've heard of. But what about all the other ones? But you can't tell uh, one from another unless you read the excellent ones, I think. That is crucial, I think, to learning how to do this job. Everybody likes to read. You know, have, having people... I used to take them a pile of scripts before digital... They were having <laughs> read them because I wanted to, you know, but that was part of the job description. And not everybody will do that. You said just now that uh, oh, people say I, I make tasteful movies. But I, I was thinking when I was looking at your filmography and was look at some of the films you, you, you know, uh, you pushed a film like um, for me, Dead Ringers is one of my favorite films. It, yeah, well, I think Dead Ringers is a perfect example of, of how things happen, which is I found the property. I was in New York then. It was a front page New York Times story about these twin gynecologists who died mysteriously. Front page. And nobody was paying any attention to this bizarre story. Who are these guys? How did this happen? What is it? And I got hooked on that story. And then it turned out that the, uh, there was a person at my poker game, I played poker in those days, uh, was writing a novel based on that story. And I optioned that novel because I loved that story so much. Well, then I moved to California and I tried to get people interested in that story and her novel. And it wasn't until David Cronenberg walked into my office and I said, I have this property. I think it's you might like it. And I pitched it to him. And this is what you have to do. When I say pitch, I had to tell him the story. Well, I was pursuing the way I was pursuing writers. I pursued directors in the early stages of their careers. I just liked doing that. And David Cronenberg had made a number of successful horror pictures that you may not have heard of. They were very well regarded. And he was considered a a new filmmaker who we should watch. And I would meet with people like that. I would ask for the meeting. And he came in. And of course, he's completely lovely and fun to talk to. 
And when I pitched him the idea, he said, you know, what do you, what do you have? And I said, well, I have this novel. And, and it was called Twins back in the day. And I gave him the novel. And he went back to Toronto. And he called up. He said, I love this, but I'm, I'm not going to do the book. I'm going to do my version of this story. And I, I was so such a fan of his. I said, okay. You know, sometimes you say, okay, even though I had the book under option, because, you know, anything could have happened. Um, he did his version. It took a very long time, took 10 years for the movie to get made because he was, because uh, we couldn't sell it. Well, we couldn't sell it. I made the rounds with David Crumber. What that means when I say make the rounds is we went together to every studio who was financing scripts and they all passed. They were intrigued. They liked David. Um, they liked my passion, but they didn't want to do it. And so it wasn't until David made the fly, which was a gigantic hit, did they say to him, okay, now what do you want to do? Because that's what happens. You have a hit and all of a sudden you get to do one you want. And he said, well, I, you know, I like this project. So you never know if it's going to stick for that long because, you know, projects come and projects go, but he never wavered in his enthusiasm for the project and he made it. And it's, you know, look at it, Stood Ringers. I mean, it was just, I'm so proud of it. And it's the film that when people say to me, you know, tell us what it's like to be involved with something like that, that is not obvious to everybody. And it just was obvious to me. I thought it was a great story. And David turned it into a work of art. You never know that that's going to happen. You could have done the novelist version and it would have been a different movie. And that's always a risk you take. What version is the best version of the material that you like? And that's why you sit down with a lot of people and hear their takes. You hear what they like, you hear what they don't like, you look at their movies. The hiring of a director is a very time-consuming process and the most fun if, if you're a moviegoer like me. I mean, I see every movie. So, you know, and, I, and my job was always to connect the material with the director and and the actors come later sometimes they come first but usually they come later and jeremy it, irons came later it must be so interesting as well because all the directors are having different their careers on different trajectories as well so it's, it depends you know getting david cronenberg in the 1980s or the 1970s or the 1990s is is almost like getting a different david cronenberg as well well you know but Nate, david has never strayed from being david cronenberg you know that's what's so great about him he stayed in toronto he did not get co-opted by hollywood he made pictures that no one else could make naked lunch i mean he did very difficult projects and many of them were literary in nature like naked lunch and he's that guy. He has not done a Marvel movie and he won't. At least I don't think so. Famous last words, but he does what, what he wants to do. He's also a writer. You know, he wrote Dead Ringers with a friend of his, Norman Snyder, mm. but they wrote together because David was very clear about what he wanted to do. And I think that's true for all of his projects. I mean, that's what you want. You want to be involved with somebody who's that singular, if if you can doesn't happen every day it really doesn't and and on the other sort of end of the uh, of the sort of the broad spectrum of what is cinema you have uh, another film that you were involved with i think you you say it's the one of the films that you mentioned first if somebody says oh what have i seen that you've made um which is um father of the bride with steve martin yeah that is my most commercial project it was a big money maker it continues to be a favorite of people getting married and other people who come into my office and they say, oh, when I got engaged, I watched Father of the Bride and and it's, it was so delightful because we're going through that same thing. It had that kind of universal appeal. Did we know that? No. It was just a movie that I loved with Spencer Tracy and Elizabeth Taylor. And I thought um, it would be a good one to remake. Remakes were not so viable then they are now every second you read another remake but then that wasn't true and uh ted turner owned the movie with warner brothers i think and uh it came from a play and that movie was a successful movie in the 50s 
And I had to figure out how to get somebody to option it because Sand Dollar didn't option stuff. Sand Dollar didn't put money down. So I took it to my friend at TriStar, which was one of the big six studios, and they mm-hmm. acquired it. And then their mandate was, okay, get us a big director or, an, or a big writer, and we'll see. They weren't in love with it, but they thought it was had potential. And that's all you want. You just want to get in the place that is potentially going to be the company that's going to spend money on the script. But what happened is we couldn't find a writer who they liked and they lost the option. I think they had it for two years and they weren't paying any attention to it. That may not be completely correct, but I, I, from my point of view is it wasn't moving along. It didn't have enough momentum. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was head of Disney, was watching it. He knew that story had potential for his company, Disney. And he, as soon as the rights lapsed, at TriStar, he picked them up and he said, I'm making this movie. And that's the other conversation you want. You want the head of the studio to say to you, I'm making this movie. And then the process starts. And you don't always agree on who is going to get hired, the writer, the director. It's a process. It takes a long time. Jeffrey had his ideas. We had our ideas. My partner, Howard Roseman, and I fought for many people along the way. And finally, we fought for Nancy Myers and Charles Shire because they seemed like the right people to do it. And you know, and then of course Steve Martin. What luck was that? He was great, but mm-hmm. he was not the first person that we went to. Uh, we went to Jack Nicholson, which which would have been a great film as well. <laughs> I I think so, but I think yes, Jack is Jack. He's, he's the greatest. But I think you know Jack is wonderful when he's a little on the edge, a little crazy. I don't think you want that Spencer Tracy character to be edgy like that. I think Steve Martin was beyond perfect. And he brought humor and warmth and accessibility. It really was one of those wonderful, lucky pieces of casting. He's fantastic. And then Marty Short on top of it, Diane Keaton. I mean, that just doesn't happen every day. That was a thrill. Yeah. Continues to be a thrill. I watch it you know, at least once a year, just to remind myself about things. (laughs) And uh, Ted Ringers, too. I love watching my movies. A lot of people don't like watching their projects. I'm not one of them. I think, really? I got that made? How how brilliant is that? In fact, um, we're screening The Good Girl, another movie I'm very proud of. On November 15, Stephen Farber conducts these classes it's called real talk r-e-e-l at the lemily theater in uh, california and uh i know him and i i called him because i heard he was selling you know he was doing movies that might sell the book i'm trying to sell the book and he said oh yeah you know what what do you want to show and i said the good girl and so i got um the director miguel Teta to agree to come. Unfortunately, Mike White, who wrote it, is in Thailand on the, you know, doing White Lotus, which is too bad because Mike's a genius and it would be great to have him there. He's not available. So we're still trying to get one of the actors to come and be part of this thing, but it will happen. And that's very exciting. You know, after all this time, I don't even want to count the years, but I haven't seen it for a long time. And that'll be very thrilling to see it on the big screen. Oh, that must be so rewarding to see that, to see a new audience see it for the first time. I mean, my my kids watch Father and the Bride when they were growing up. And, uh, you know, it's it, it was probably seven or eight years old when they were children, you know. So it's, uh, it's great to see them having that longevity. Well, you never know what's going to last. You know, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But once they're made, they're, they exist forever. They don't. They might not be showable on Turner Classic Movies, but somehow or other, you can find them. And I've made some pretty obscure movies, but they're there. It, it's done. You know, like we're publishing a book. It's it's mm. in between covers, and you can read it. 
It's very exciting. The finished project is a thrill, no matter what. And I, I think every movie is somebody's favorite movie. It does, you know, we're, we're, the number of people I've talked to, the number of journalists I talk to, who their favorite ever movie is some just out of the ballpark. I would never have guessed it. Completely, you know, crazy. I've, it, it's great. I think, uh, you know, you'll always a, a movie has a way of finding an audience um and even if it's a small audience well i think it's true and people do ask me what my favorite movie is because i've been having these interviews but i don't pick anything temporary i i i say uh the best years of our lives you know i mean i i watch the classics all the time that's what i choose to watch the movies that i grew up on that moved me that got me excited about movies in the first place those are the ones that i watch and they're all famous, you know, all about Eve. You know, the movie stars who were in them, Joan Crawford or Betty Davis or Paul Newman or Marlon Brando, these movies are fantastic, and they I never get tired of them. So I'm sure other people have those favorites too. Not the students. They do not watch black and white movies. We'll change that. We'll change that. If, they, if any of them listen to this podcast, they'll have to, they'll have to <laughs> find some. Well, you know, it, it's surprising, but you know, th- those movies move more slowly for people. They don't have action in them. They're not easy to sell to these kids. They're just not. They like The Godfather, but who doesn't? You know, but I'm going back a little bit of ways. You know, um, movies, noir movies are black and white, famous for being black and white. And every once in a while, a director will make a black and white movie. And everybody is, gets worried. What is he doing that for? You know, but it's it's interesting. Um, David Fincher's new movie is a noir, but it's in color. I haven't seen it. But I but I asked, I said, what? I wonder why he decided to make a noir, but not have it be in black and white. Well, maybe he wanted to sell some tickets, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think it's harder to uh, to sell black and white movies. I, I saw the film. It's uh, The Killer. I saw it in Venice. Yes. Oh, how is it? Is it great? To tell you the truth, I found a couple of movies a little bit disappointing in Venice that I was hoping were great. And they weren't. It wasn't that they were bad in any, in any shape or form, but Michael Mann's Ferrari, I found good. And I wanted it. I wanted to love it. And um, similarly, David Fincher's The Killer. I thought this is going to be amazing, and it was good. You know, <laughs> and, um, interesting. Interestingly, there were quite a few hitmen movies uh, at the festival, and Richard Linklater's film, which is called Hitman, actually sort of deconstructs the whole idea and made the other films look a little bit silly in, in retrospect. Well, you were lucky to go there. I can't wait to see these movies. You know, all I, I hear about them, I read about them, but I haven't seen any of them. I think I'm going to see um, the French movie that won the Palme d'Or. I think it's showing at the Academy next Anatomy week. Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah. Uh, people seem to think it's great. Yeah, super. Uh, I can't wait. But I have to wait like anybody else, you know. I mean, they're starting to show them now, uh, mm-hmm. but the, I haven't seen uh, screenings of the Fincher movie announced yet i think there's uh alexander payne's movie screening soon anyway they'll all be here and we're all excited to see them. we've been waiting for these quality movies for a long time now it's always like that after the summer you know then you get the fall and you get oscar contenders and you know you get excited yeah yeah it becomes a really rich season hopefully so in the book when one of the things I love is there's so many wonderful anecdotes that when you're when you're sort of giving some advice, it's always backed up by oh, oh this is a this is a moment when I had to go and you know uh, talk to an actor about a very difficult decision. And one of the um, uh, films that you mention, IQ, is one where you have to sort of intervene in a way which uh, which um, is very delicate. Let's say. Well, you know that was difficult. I mean, when I think about that now, I think, wow, that was really tough because you're dealing with a major movie star, Meg Ryan, and you're dealing with um, a big studio, big budget movie by my standards. Um, At panel, Terry Lansing's ahead, uh, Walter Matthau and and Tim Robbins and a, you know, a handsome budget. And then um, 
one of the jobs of the producer is to be be there, to listen and to watch and to make sure that everything is going according to plan. And on the first day, I heard Meg Ryan talking in a very kind of Catherine Hepburn kind of accent because she's playing the niece of Albert Einstein and she's educated and she has pedigrees. And I think she thought, and I don't know if she talked to anybody about this because it was a surprise to me that she thought that mid-Atlantic accent was the way to go. Mm. And sometimes actors do that. And it's our job, the directors, the producers, the studio, everybody to say, that's not good. It's not working. And that can be a very, very, very delicate situation. Nobody heard it the way I heard it. And I talked to my partner, Scott Rudin, and the director, and they were busy doing what they were doing, and it didn't bother them. Mm. So I called, I did something maybe you're not supposed to do, uh, but it really was bothering me. And we were three days into it. And I and it wasn't changing. That was the accent. And I called the head of the studio, Sherry Lansing, and I said, "Would you please pay attention to this? I'm not sure that this is going well." And she said, "Are you kidding? We're we're not paying Meg Ryan whatever that we were paying her to talk like Catherine Hepburn. It's not going to be." She made the call, and sometimes that happens. Not a lot. Usually, the studio defers to the director or whomever, but Sherry was very much behind this project. She loved this project. She was the one who said, hire Walter Matthau, when everybody said, no, you know, really? Um, turned out to be a, a good idea, a great idea, and he's a delight. But so so that's what happened. And I don't know, because uh, what, what Meg Ryan really thought when she got that note, I don't know if she was turned off whether it ruined her week, mm. I don't know. I never really found out how she felt about it. All I know is that she started talking like herself. And that's the job of a producer. And sometimes you don't get your way. Sometimes nobody gets behind you. You know, I had another movie called Shining Through, big budget movie. Fox was behind it. And the cut was so long. And we tried to get the studio to kind of bear down on the director to tighten it. And it didn't happen. Sometimes they don't think it's worth it. And sometimes they do. And so the producer's job, it's a hard job because you have to watch and and have the taste and the guts to get it done. And sometimes you don't get it done. Sometimes the studio wins and sometimes you win. And it's to say win isn't fair. It's not a war, but sometimes it feels that way. You know, you, you, you've got to assert yourself, but you, you want to do it in a gentle way. And it's, you know, it's an interesting job, a challenging job. <laughs> I can hear the diplomacy that you you must be able to, to deploy on the set, even as you're telling me. I mean, one of the examples... Uh, the... I don't know if I'm always a diplomat. I don't know if I'm the best <laughs> diplomat. I'm, I have learned over the years because I am outspoken and I have very strong opinions, but, you know, you learn how to be a diplomat. Yes, that's what one of the things you have to learn or you won't be able to do it very long. But uh, I do have strong opinions. There are producers who don't have strong opinions, who just kind of defer. I, I, I don't understand that, but, you know, we're all kinds of us, all kinds of different ways to get it. Well, one of the battles you, you refer to that you, did, you didn't win necessarily was Robert De Niro in Jackknife having uh, turning up with a beard and wanting to play the character with the beard. And his agents all saying, you know, don't don't say anything about the beard to Rob Bobby. Bobby won't, won't, you know, you're just not going to win. You know, looking back on that, I feel silly, I think. So he wanted a beard. Why were we complaining? It's De Niro. We're so delighted to get him in this movie. He's the best actor alive, you could argue, or certainly up there. I was I was thrilled to pieces. But the other argument, and I guess I succumbed to it, is, okay, he's going to have a beard. We're not going to even recognize him. That's where, is there a compromise? He wants the beard. He saw the character very clearly, long, greasy hair. He's suffering from PTSD. He's a little crazy. And that's how he saw it. And 
I don't know even why we bothered, but we did because we felt we have De Niro and we want to uh, put him on the poster so that you could see his face, his fabulous De Niro face. And it didn't happen, you know, and and I, I, as I say, looking back at it, that was a battle I shouldn't have fought. But the agency uh, who helped me finance the movie really got on my case. And I guess I agreed. But now I've seen the movie and I think, what what were we talking about? Sometimes you think, that, what, what were we talking about? Come on, it's De Niro. And he was, and he was great. Oh, and he's, he's great. He's always great. I can't wait to see the Scorsese picture because I hear he's great. And he is. He's just one of the great actors of all time. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see him back with Scorsese as well. I, you know, um, the Irishman, and and I'm I've got the same problem with the title as you have: the Killers of the Flower Moon, the Flower Moon Killing, <laughs> Killing Flowers, Flowers Moon, Moon Kill Flower Moon. It's a bit of a word salad that that uh, mm-hmm. that title. Um, so uh, the the other thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of like diplomacy as well. Um, of course, you've you've gone through, lived through several uh, sort of earthquakes in 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 terms of producers and in terms of work practices in Hollywood. Uh, you just mentioned Scott Rudin, who, who uh, you know is one of the most um, infamous uh, producers um, uh, in terms of his uh, let's say I don't know work work environment and and sort of personal relationship practices in terms of that. Your take is is very interesting because also you you're. You're a woman working in a in a very male dominated environment. Perhaps you could tell our listeners how how you've managed to navigate that that situation by ignoring it. Basically, you know, I <laughs> I was a woman at a time where women weren't really climbing the ladder. There were many of us who read manuscripts and did that job. That job fell to women. I'm not sure why. Uh, the job of writing notes falls to women. Uh, we have the attention span to do it. And uh, and so I did it. But when I came to California and I went up for different jobs, I would lose them to men because for many reasons. One, I had a family and I wasn't willing. I had boundaries. I needed to go home at night to my children. I needed to uh, not work like a maniac. And I think people knew that. And so I lost jobs because of it. It didn't bother me because there was always another job. And the people who hired me understood that. And I, though, I did have a job at Fox where the head of the studio said to me, if you don't go out to the restaurants of choice every night of the week, you're going to get fired. And I got fired because I didn't go out to the restaurants and I couldn't do it. They should have fired me, I guess. I don't know. It seems looking back on that now, you look back, I think, really? Is that so important? I could have done my job just beautifully without doing that. But when I said to the head of the studio, my writers, who I cherish, don't want to put on a jacket and tie and go to the Ivy. And his answer was, find different writers. And that was kind of a joke, but not so funny. And I got fired. And You know, I just want to go on record as saying good things about Scott, who's because Scott is brilliant. And Scott is one of the rare people who reads the manuscript, who really has a strong opinion. Certain movies would not get made without Scott. And he took that taste. Scott has very good taste. He knew what to champion. And people listened because he had such a good track record. But there are is the other side. And unfortunately, that happened to him. But he fired me at Fox. So I, I but I, I produced IQ with him. So I I know both sides of Scott. But you know, the, the brilliant side to me will always be the side I remember, because he is brilliant. And we need that. We need those readers. We need the people who are passionate and stick to their guns and fight the good fight. And there, there's an element of abrasiveness that, that can be tolerated, and then it, it steps over a line into abuse, I guess. Having Malcolm McDowell saying, oh, you look like the woman who's come to serve the tea to you. And that, I mean, that kind of stuff must be, sometimes you <laughs> must want to say, okay, and then pour the tea in his lap. You know what? I was flattered, to tell you the truth. Here I am sitting at a, a fancy restaurant in Santa Barbara. We were trying to get him for a play, and... That was his take on me. I was wearing a hat. It was summer. 
And I thought what he was saying, my translation was, oh, you're elegant. Not that you're a server, but the, but the way you're dressed. You don't, you don't look like a producer to me. You look like a, an elegant lady. He maybe used the wrong words, but that was my translation. You know, he was very respectful and I got a kick out of it. And yeah, yeah, people evaluate you for all kinds of reasons. How you dress is one of them. And I guess I don't dress like a thug. <laughs> <laughs> and the other transformation that's happened to the industry, you know, you've, you've, we've had uh, we've had that. We've had Me Too as well, and we've also had well, just the explosion of streamers and and Netflix and Amazon. How what what's what has that changed uh, as far as you can tell? Well, you know, for my money, they don't operate the way I operate, which is as a uh, they want a package. They want us such a chicken and the egg thing. If we have a script, uh, and uh, talk to any producer and they will agree with this. If we have a script and you take it to any of these places, they say, who's in it? Who's directing it? What's your package? Well, you can't get the package without the company behind you. So you're, you know, I can't go to these places with, with an original piece of material. And that's terrible. So, and they don't uh, cultivate writers the way I did growing up, that was key to me. Cultivate talent. Maybe they do it and I don't know about it, which is possible, but I don't think so because everybody seems to complain about it. And so some of these movies that are getting made, a lot of them are good, but some of them you say, well, why, why did that happen? But then we all, producers always say, how did that get made? Why did they make my movie? They made that movie. But, you know, um, it just feels, people will say, but there's so many buyers out there. There's so many people doing it, but it doesn't feel that way to me. It feels like easier to get things done when the people at the studios, the executives were friends, when you could say to somebody, oh my God, I read the best script this weekend. Would you read it? I don't see that that gets done that way. That language, that conversation isn't held in the same way. In my experience. I I, I can never quite feel the... Uh... Netflix movie, specifically Netflix, really, it feels like going back to the 70s and 80s and TV movies, you know, it feels like that same, you know, there have been some very good ones, but they're all films I've seen outside of the TV. So I've seen The Irishman on the big screen. I've seen Roma on the big screen. They don't feel like Netflix movies, but every other Netflix movie feels like a Netflix movie. Well, it's hard to define it, you know, I and I, I don't, I think What's what's the loss is for people like me is the relationships with the buyers. You know, how do you make them when they don't seem to want it? You know, um, it was always about making buddies with the person at the studio, with Sherry Lansing saying, hey, you guys should hire Walter Matthau. That's a conversation you want. You want it to be about the creative part, the taste part, the part that, well, this we think this is going to make money. Sherry believed that this was a big money maker. It turned out it wasn't. But she believed in the project, believed in it. And I I don't hear that too much. I'm sure it exists. But if Marty Scorsese wants to do it, we believe in it. If Ridley Scott wants to do it, we believe in it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the people who count get believed in. I, I find that upsetting. Where's the new talent out there? that's being discovered by these people. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question, actually, of, of, of sort of the younger generations coming up. Is there anyone who you look at and you think, okay, they're, they're going to be, you know, Tommy Lee Jones at the end of No Country for Old Men, they're going to be taking the fire forward into the, you know, into the next, into the future. Well, you know, I watched, uh, I think it was Netflix, I'm not sure, The Burial with Tommy Lee Jones. And it was such a thrill to see him again. He hasn't been in anything I've seen in a long time. And that's what I kept thinking. Tommy Lee Jones, he's an old guy now, but what a fabulous act. And he brought so much to this part. And and uh, uh, Jamie Foxx, fabulous. You know, two of our great actors, they hired them. They knew to do that. Uh, and it was, you know, I, I ask everybody, who is the new Ryan Gosling? Who is the new Tommy Lee Jones? People are hard pressed to tell me. And I think, well, I think they see every Mar Marvel movie, so they may be hiding in those movies, but where are they? How are they going to get discovered? 
many of those actors kicked around for a long time. Look at Clooney's career. You know, did a lot of television before he became George Clooney. You know, so people do have to pay a lot of dues, which is fine. But where are they? I haven't had to cast a movie with young movie stars in a long time. Uh, and it might be an interesting thing to do. When we were casting um, Noah Baumbach's first movie, Kicking and Screaming, we only had money to pay newcomers. And so we had to look at everybody. That was thrilling to do that, you know, with a new director and new everything, no money and new talent. And the biggest name on that movie was, well, we had two. We had Parker Posey, who was the indie queen, uh, and Eric Stoltz, who had been fired off of Back to the Future. But those weren't names, really, by today's standards. And then all these other people lined up to be in that movie. That's exciting to me. Um, I want the opportunity to do that and find out who these people are. They're out there waiting to be tapped. Yeah, there used to be those. I mean, remember Francis Ford Coppola making The Outsiders and, you know, there were like five or six young young actors who, you know, Tom Cruise was in that and a whole bunch of others who, you know, then made careers for themselves. Matt Dillon, I think, is in that. Um, one last question, uh, Carol. You've been really generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I always ask for uh, you to, for my guests to recommend a, a film book. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to have your recommendation for our listeners. I think that Tarantino's book is a must read. Even if you're not a fan of his movies, you will be a fan of this book. This book, his excitement about movies is so infectious that both my husband and I read it in the same week. And we... Or a little scholarly, that's our nature. We watched every single movie that he talked about in the book mm. because he makes you want to, he makes you love the movies. And his writing is great. He's a great writer. We know that about him. But his joy about this talking about movies is like, it's like Scorsese. You know, they, they light up when they talk about movies. And that's why I recommend that book. It's really fun to read. It's a page turner. And, you know, Scott Feinberg has just put out his 100 best movie books. Do you know about this? The AFI. I voted in it. Oh, you voted? Yeah. Well, guess what? I'm on the list. Oh, brilliant. I'm, I made the list. Excellent. And I'm very, very, very proud to be included with, I mean, one of my other favorite movie books is uh, the Truffaut Hitchcock book. Which is number one. I think every time I, yeah, every time I uh, watch a Hitchcock movie, I pull out the book and see what, what did the, what did they talk about? Uh, that's fun to do. If you can do that with a critic, um, you know, of course, any of the Pauline Kill reviews, but I tend not to do that, but we always go to, um, Manny Farber, to go to uh, my friend Peter Rayner, mm. um, the people who really are excited about movies mm. and in the right way. Absolutely, I think that's. I think that's uh, so. I, I always have this idea that certain things go well together, like chocolate and coffee, and and you know, reading and watching movies. You know, I read books about films. It makes me want to watch more films. When I watch more films, it makes me want to read more about them and, and novels, which they're based on and everything. So it, it's a, a beautiful, virtuous circle. Yeah, I mean, I try to not know too much about the movie, if possible, mm -hmm. because it's a thrill when you see something that's pure. We went to see this movie. I don't even remember the name of it with Bill Pullman's son, tiny movie. We didn't know anything, and it was, and I'm just I'm blowing it because I don't remember the name of the movie, but it was such a good independent movie. And I thought, oh, they live, you know, how it's exciting. They exist. Um, yes. And so that's what we want. We want the freshness. We want to be surprised. We want to see, oh, that's a new talent. You know, everybody's looking for the new talent, and then the new talent. Start making Marvel movies. So, you know, to me, that's always disappointing, I have to say. Yeah, I love Chloe Zhao. And I was like, oh, don't, don't, Chloe, don't, don't do it. But you understand why they do it, you know? Uh, people want to be mean. I mean, why is Spielberg doing um, a remake of Bullet? I mean, even a remake of West Side Story felt a little bit unnecessary. Well, that's arguable, but Bullet? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
you know, he's Gilbert, he can do whatever he wants. So that surprised me. Sometimes I get surprised by that, those choices, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I screened the two versions of West Side Story for my students because I did a class on snakes and I told them about Father of the Bride, naturally. But the other movies we did as remakes were West Side Story and um, The Birdcage, La Cage au Ah, of course, yes. Oh, it's wonderful. You know, both versions are wonderful. And uh, I just wanted them to see that there's a source of material to go to in addition to books and ideas and originals. There are movies from a long time ago that you can fall in love with and say, who owns it? How do we get it? You know, I mean, Birdcage is Mike Nichols and Robin Williams, and, uh, you know, it's a fabulous movie. But it started in France. It was a French movie, also a hit in France. Mm. And then, of course, The Star is Born has been remade many times. You know, how many times? Four times. Or four or five, I think, even. But four or five, many times. So, you know, that's my class. That's what I talk about in class. Let's see how to do that. And then they're required to come up with one that they would remake. Oh, that's a good but one. Because they don't know. Well, but because they don't know movies that are old, they pick things that are a little too current. So I say, oh, no, no, that's too recent. You can't do that. You have to go back in time a little bit. Well, what film would you remake? Well, I'd remake The Fountainhead. Right. Which, do you know The Fountainhead? The Ayn Rand adaptation. I, yeah, that's the problem. I mean, because people have a lot of prejudices against her. But also, I think what makes it maybe unmakeable, I, I, th I know that people have tried, good people have tried, and it hasn't happened. Because he's blowing up a building of his own work, it's too terrorist. You know, in the original movie, he blows up the building as an act of integrity. How dare you mess with my work? And you buy it and you support him. Now, if somebody did that, they would seem crazy and dangerous. So that's tricky. But somebody could solve that because that love story is one of the great love stories of all time, in my view. You know, I love that movie. I could see it again and again and again. And um, the other movie I would remake is The Bad and the Beautiful. Oh, Kirk Douglas. Which I understand. Scorsese. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's a Hollywood story. And Hollywood has a prejudice against doing Hollywood stories. But that's one of the great movies. And I think Scorsese flirted with it. And uh, maybe that'll happen one day. But it is a Hollywood story. And it's magnificent. And sometimes I think, don't mess with the greats. They're too great. You know, don't mess with Psycho. Don't mess with The Apartment. You know, there's don't mess with All About Eve. There's certain things that are so exquisite, you don't want to touch them. Yeah. On the other hand, somebody, somebody's going to. <laughs> and, all, you know, Sabrina got remade by Sidney Pollack, and it wasn't good. And Sabrina's one of the great movies with Audrey Hepburn. So it does happen, even great people with the best of intentions, sometimes cast it incorrectly or whatever don't have the billy walter touch you know it's really hard to do So I hope you enjoyed that conversation between me and Carol. I certainly did, as you can as you can probably tell from. I love these conversations because it's just such an insider's point of view. There's just so many ways that you suddenly look at a film in a totally new way. I like the idea as well of certain decisions not being in the control of the director or the producer, but the star's behest. You know, um, uh, one of the examples that she uses in the book that we didn't uh, touch on, similar to De Niro's beard, is Tom Hanks's hair. In in the Da Vinci Code. It says, when you, whenever you see a decision in a film and you think, how did anybody let that happen? Chances are the actor had an idea that nobody had the good sense or the courage to, or the power to, to contradict. Uh, <laughs> so that answered a question that I'd long wondered about. Tom Hanks's hair in the Da Vinci Code was for me my Da Vinci Code. That was my, <laughs> that was my worry. Um, uh, it was interesting as well that um, Carol's recommendation uh, for Quentin Tarantino's Cinema Speculation, a relatively recent book, but but a really entertaining one, um, 
uh, it's it's well worth uh, uh, I've read it as well it's well worth a, a read if you want to read Carol's book of course there is a link in the show notes that will take you to um, to 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 a site where you can buy it but you can buy it in many different places I'm sure um, next week Tom Schoen is going to be here and we're going to be talking about uh, Barbara Heimer we're going to be talking about strikes and we're going to be talking about the year's blockbusters um, who, who better to talk to than the author of the book Blockbuster <laughs> okay uh, talk to you soon take care